Okay, we are recording, and uh, we can start here now if you'd like. If okay. Allison and you're both ready, you go ready. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, um, it's officially three o five. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just literally like to thank you all for uh, taking the time to join us today. Um, definitely, truly means a lot that you're here. Um, obviously, everything is very difficult being online now. So I know I'm not tech savvy. Um, so. As you can tell by the screen, my name is Elson Kavanaugh. I'm a business administration student at MUN, actually, and I'm here today because I'm also a Memorial Ambassador. Um, so for some of you, this is probably the first face of MUN you see. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of a lot of things that I have done, but what an honor it was to have been personally asked to be the one doing this interview today. Um, very big fan of your work. Um, have always wanted to speak to you again, but I've never known about anything going on. <laughs> um, so like literally as soon as I saw your name, like immediately agreed. Um, didn't matter that I'm supposed to be studying for my finals right now, <laughs> but uh, here we are. So um, thank you so much for also taking the time to be here today, um, taking time to speak with me. Um, my pleasure. I was in a bit of a pickle though, because I was told I had to do a brief introduction about who you are. Um, <laughs> And it was rough because how do I sum up Emma Hickey was my issue. Um, Self-proclaimed like passionate humanist and incredible activist, like you spent countless years campaigning for LGBTQ plus rights in Canada. Like you co-led the movement for same-sex marriage back in 2005, founded the Pathways Foundation. Um, then in 2015, you literally completed a month long walk across Newfoundland. <laughs> you do realize that is almost a thousand kilometers, correct? Yeah, I felt every step, every step. Oh, <laughs> dear, say you did. Yeah, sure. Um, so out of everything that you could have done to raise awareness for um, survivors of clergy abuse, um, why did you walk across Newfoundland? I walked across Newfoundland for a number of reasons. Uh, some of them you already highlighted, but Mainly, I wanted to pay tribute to the men who were young boys at the time who came from various parts of the island to stay at Mount Castle Orphanage. They were orphaned, and so they came from all over the island. And so um, I wanted to symbolize that journey by paying tribute to them, but also um, ending my walk at the Mount Castle Memorial, which is really the only living monuments, the only monument um, to religious institutional abuse survivors. Uh, it's the gateposts of the original orphanage there off uh, over by Elizabeth Avenue. So, um, but mainly to engage people, to raise awareness and, you know, to, to pay some, to pay tribute to the, to these brave, uh, brave men who are like heroes to me in many ways. Yeah, that's definitely admirable. Not everyone would walk across an island. Um, that is for certain. Um, uh, my body could never. <laughs> um, so a little bit more history then. Um, so three years ago, actually this month, Canada introduced non-binary passports. Mm -hmm. um, and you were one of the first people to receive one. Mm -hmm. um, and December will mark three years after being the first person to receive a non-binary birth certificate as well. Um, yeah. brought to the Supreme Court of Canada yourself. Um, what was that like? Well, the Supreme Court of Newfoundland and Labrador, um, because it was, uh, birth certificates are provincial. They're, it's okay, jurisdiction yeah. provincial. But um, yeah, um, it was a incredible experience for me in many ways. Um, you know, I just feel like I have a strong sense of social responsibility. So for me, it was... Uh, and I also work uh, with a lot of young people who are struggling with identity um, challenges. And I was in a place where I could um, go and apply. And, and, uh, and so I did, you know, with them in my heart. And, uh, you know, people think we have a transition. When you transition, you know, I was, I was assigned female at birth. And then later in life, after my walk, actually uh, decided to pursue hormone therapy but I didn't necessarily feel exclusively male. So uh, people think there's always an end point to a transition, but there's no end point really. The journey continues every day. You know, I change and evolve and 
And so for me, non-binary felt um, like my my identity. And so, um, you know, you, you go through all these, you question, you have lots of questions as you're transitioning. And, and one of the big ones that people asked me, friends and family was, what are you going to do with your name? You know, you're, you're looking more masculine. Are you going to change your name? And I'm like, I love my name. You know, I love my name and, and, and I don't want to change my name, you know, and, and I feel like I'm Gemma regardless, you know? So I just said, let's just change the law instead. And, uh, you know, and, and, and for so many reasons, um, you know, I just did that because I felt that it was something that I was in a place where I could do it. Um, and so I wanted to kind of get people, I wanted to push people to think differently and, and, from my own experience with lobbying and um, legislate changes changes in legislation, I just I knew that this would be the step um, forward for society, really, and and for me as an individual. Yeah, no, definitely. There's definitely been a long history of just extraordinary fighting to change the constitution in Canada of what laws are you know constitutional or not because so many things seem so normal for so long, but they're really not. Um, it's definitely amazing that you decided to be a part of that history and um, definitely change a lot of people's lives um, even if you didn't like you didn't, like directly know them and such yeah well you know it was just something that I felt inside that I had to do um, sure. I was the first person in, in the whole country and you know I had experienced a lot of uh, death threats and property damage over the years you know going back to when I was lobbying for same-sex marriage Social media makes you that much more accessible and more vulnerable. Um, you know, the amount of hatred that I had experienced um, from going out on this limb to lobby for non-binary rights, um, the volume had increased, you know, and uh, it was it was challenging at times. But I feel solid in myself. And, uh, you know, as a leader, you got to know that you're doing the right thing. You're taking the right course and you just do it because it's not just, a, it doesn't just impact you, you know? Definitely, definitely. Um, I love how earlier you mentioned that, like, when people ask you what you're doing with your name, you're like, well, this is my name, this is what I love. Um, because I remember um, your documentary that uh, you released back in 2017, um, which was entitled Just Be Gemma. Um, I love the story behind why you entitled it that, um, if you'd like to share that. Oh, well. Um, yeah, the, um, the producer director, Peter Walsh, uh, you know, I had, he had interviewed me a number of times, uh, as, during the process of the documentary. And, um, one of the stories that he loved was about my grandmother and, and she was in her nineties at the time. And I had just started testosterone and I was visiting her and, uh, she had said to me, um, you know, I, I sounded different to her. And she had said, you know, what's wrong with you? You got a cold or something? I said, no, I'm on testosterone. And, and she's like, what are you going to do with your breasts? And I said, well, I'm going to get them off. And she's like, yes, get them off. You don't need them. And, and then she's, you know, asked me all these questions and stuff. And, and, I, and anyway, I said, uh, she, I said, man, I might not want to be a boy or a girl. And she said, uh, just be Gemma. That's all Nan wants, you know? And I think that that's, that just doesn't go for, me in my situation, I think it's for anyone, really. Just be who you are, you know, whatever that is. And uh, I think that's, that's an important message. And so that's what Peter used to, uh, as the title for for the documentary, um, which I loved, you know, because... I thought it was super sweet. Uh, it, was, it was a good uh, tribute to my nan, who actually passed away in the process of filming the documentary. So um, it was a nice way of having her still a part of, uh, part of the, uh, the doc. You know, definitely my condolences. I just want to say too, you know, like you introduced me and it's like, whoa, it's, it's really great to hear all these really awesome things about, you know, myself. But at the same time, I just want you to know and everyone else to know that I'm just as honored to be here and be a part of this. I think that leadership is a give and take kind of relationship. It's an exchange. And so um, I'm humbled as well. And I know that there's lots of things that I can learn from you and and anyone really who's watching. And so uh, I really love these types of opportunities because for me, connection is the most important thing. And that's what I, I think has made me successful as a leader and as an advocate uh, because I, I love people, you know? So um, thank you for, thank you for you. <laughs> oh, 
that's super sweet. Um, definitely um, the chance to do these online as well, because normally if the university was open, they'd be done on campus in like a lecture hall. Um, yeah. Definitely making these more accessible to everyone um, definitely helps. So. And uh, to learn about leadership and such from a great leader, you literally changed the law. Um, <laughs> takes a lot to do that. Um, you keep mentioning leadership and obviously this is the launch fourth leadership series. Um, so what does leadership mean to you? It means standing up for what's right. And sometimes that means taking a big risk. Sometimes that means moving way out of your comfort zone. Sometimes that means, well, in my particular case, that my own personal safety was compromised. But for me, it's about doing the right thing. And not just for me, but for society as a whole, because we all have to live here. We all have to share this space. And if I can do something to make it better, then I'm going to step up. Um, you know, for me, I've had just like everyone, you know, life isn't fair. And I've had a lot of uh, experiences in my life, some good, some bad. I've learned from all of those. And, you know, the moment that I'm a sexual abuse survivor, the moment that I, you know, realized that I could use my trauma as wings instead of chains was the moment that I knew that there was no limit to how high I could soar, you know? And, and I think that, I think that a lot of work and uh, to get where I am, but at the same time, you know, I think that that has really shaped me um, and made me who I am today in terms of how I relate with other people. And I, I feel that, uh, you know, you don't really need to be anybody other than yourself, you know, and, and, uh, and being genuine, you know, I, I don't want to be one of those people that gets up in front of other people that, and, and, and isn't genuine because for me, you know, my grandmother used to say it about me. I wear my heart on my sleeve, you know, and, uh, I think people like to see themselves reflected, you know, in, uh, in leaders. I know I do when I look up to people. I like to see that they're real, they're raw, you know, and that we can relate to each other. And so, uh, so for me, I, I feel that that, I hope it comes through anyway in everything that I do. Definitely, definitely. Um, I love the important points that you mentioned there of just being yourself, being true to yourself and genuine um, and just never giving up on what you want to see in the world um, because you're just here to change it in for the good. Um, Obviously, there's been a lot, like, I'll say facts, um, like you mentioned, like your personal safety compromised and such. Um, what keeps you going in times like that? People like you, you know, uh, <laughs> serious support from other people, you know, a smile, a high five, a hug, um, you know, for the number of, you know, death threats I've gotten or, you know, any of those things, the, the amount of, of messages that I get from people all over the world, you know, takes all of that away from me, you know, and, and, uh, it really helps, you know, when you're having a bad day or you're having a, a bad experience or someone's not being very kind to you. I mean, I've been spit on, you know, that's a very humiliating experience, but instead I just wiped it off my face and it gave me fuel to keep on going and do what I do. And, uh, and it's because I get so much love from people that uh, it really helps me uh, helps me keep one foot in front of the other, just like on the road, you know, to get where I got to go. It's, uh, it's definitely nice to hear how many people back you up. Um, I personally think what you do uh, have done, continue to do is definitely amazing. Um, has definitely helped so many people. Um, you mentioned um, like the qualities that you look for in um, a leader, someone you look up to. So who actually is your leadership role model? You know, I'm thinking about a lot of things now that I take up masculine space. And for a long time in my life, you know, growing up as a kid, I mean, really, I looked up to a lot of men because that's all that were really in the public. You know, I had superheroes that I, I looked up to. I wanted to be like Superman, you know, <laughs> because I think I felt like for a long time that, you know, I read a lot as a kid and that took me, reading and writing took me out of 
horrible situations that I was in. And, and so I looked to, to superheroes to kind of put me out of a situation. So I, in a way, I had to be my own superhero, you know, as a little kid to kind of move myself out of all that pain. And so, um, you know, and there were other leaders, too, along the way. And I'm an avid reader, and, and so I looked up to Nelson Mandela, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., so many of those, um, those leaders. But when I think about it, they're all men. So I was, think, I was trying to think about today, you know, who really stood out. And the first person that came to my mind when I saw the question was my mother, you know, and, um, and my grandmothers, both of them, you know. And, and I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing a master's in gender studies, so I, I've read a lot of feminist theory. And really, feminist theory just blew my mind and saved my life and really informed my transition. And uh, so, you know, looking back through the years, I think to myself, you know, um, I look to those women and how they handled their day to day, you know, and how they persevered. And I think that's where I come from, you know. And so uh, so my mother really was the first person that came to my mind when I saw that question. So, um, yeah. That is definitely really nice. Family definitely shapes a lot. Um, so, um, backpedaling a little bit, um, you mentioned your childhood and I guess in case, um, people don't know the background of that, um, how did your childhood, um, frame who you came to be? Well, I mean, I think our childhood really, you know, really is part of who we are. And, and for me, Growing up on an island, you know, the landscape, the ocean, the weather, all of that, you know, embodied my resilience in a way and, and something that, you know, that I look to. I look to all of that for, for inspiration in many ways. And, and uh, I think, you know, being a sexual abuse survivor as well, you know, that, that kind of positioned me for a long time, you know, as, as a victim, you know. Um, and... I think when you can come from that perspective and get through it, you really learn a lot from that and you know how to be to the point where, to the point where you become a survivor and you, you know, you know, you can empathize, you can empathize with people and you can, you can understand them, you know? And, and I think that that informed me in, in many ways. It informed the work that I do with, with women and the other type of community work that I do. Um, you know, and, and also reading, I read, so much as a child and and I still do and that has really uh, shaped who I am as a writer um, you know and, and really my imagination saved my life in, in so many ways because you know when I couldn't get out of my own personal circumstances at home I was able to to travel anywhere I wanted to go in a book you know I could slay dragons in a book I could beat anything in a book you know monsters I wasn't afraid of anything and so I I really feel that growing up on an island, Newfoundland, um, you know, having those traumatic experiences that I had, and also just reading and writing just really made me who I am today and uh, really shaped me and, and framed me. But when we say framed, you know, it doesn't mean that, that those types of things trap me in any way you know identities they don't have to they don't have to trap us you know no. they're just a part of who we are and i feel like i have many of those i have many things that shape my identity i'm not one or the other i'm all of those things you know and so uh i think it's important for for people to remember that you know our very essence our our, our spirit you know all of those types of things they don't they can't be categorized you know and that's a beautiful thing it truly is to think about that like that, that um, nothing has defined who you are, has made you trapped inside something, and that's just what you are. Um, you definitely have expanded outside of that, which is really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Did um, you always see yourself as wanting to make like a change in the world? Um, I think I've always been a fighter. I think uh, I've always had, you know, this, uh, well, growing up, I always felt uh, called to ministry, actually, 
so I, I had a really close relationship with, uh, with, you know, God. I come from an Irish Roman Catholic background and church was a very big part of my life. Um, I was abused by a priest. So, you know, obviously that had a huge impact on me. But, uh, you know, from a very early age, I did feel very called uh, to God, to, to ministry, to, to um, being a part of something bigger, you know. And, uh, you know, and I feel like I'm, I'm living that today. You know, it's not a part, I'm not, I'm not part of an institutionalized uh, faith by any means. But uh, I do feel that when I was a kid, I did feel that I was called to something bigger than myself. And so I do feel that that was always in me. Um, although I couldn't explain it or had the words for it, I just, uh, I just followed my path and there's been lots of twists and turns and it's been lots of bumps, you know, but, uh, but here I am. That's definitely nice. I guess that, uh, explains the, uh, undergrad and religious studies that. Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. I mean, I, I wanted to learn religion through an academic perspective outside of a faith perspective, you know, cause I. There's this there's this curiosity that's that's been in, that's been a part of me since I was a since I was very small since I was able to have words you know to, to be able to describe my my thoughts and feelings and I was always curious and, um, and so my mind was always inquisitive and you know and 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 there was only so many there was limits to to what you can know and learn in faith you know a lot of it is instilled in belief but I wanted to know more I wanted to go deeper I wanted to learn things. Historically, I wanted to look at translations of the Bible. I wanted to re really uh, expand on that, you know, and so that was really that was why I chose to do religious studies. Um, it's definitely super nice to know that um, like the events in your life didn't um, deter you from the path that you wanted to do relating to um, religion and serving and such. Um, that's definitely very nice to see. Well, thank you. I, I mean, you know, <laughs> if I can just say this to you know anyone who really will want to listen or, or want to hear it it's it's that you know people are like what do you you know you're a leader what do you how do you be a leader or what you know the biggest thing i can tell you and anyone else really is that for me being a leader means you got to know when to lead and you got to know when to follow and following sometimes is just as important as leading can't get caught up in your own ego you know ever because there's lots of people around who deserve a seat at the table as well. And sometimes that means you don't speak, you know? And I'm thinking a lot about that now as someone who embodies this masculine space, you know? I don't look like a woman now. Sometimes that means I have to step back, you know, in order to give others a space to, to, to speak. And sometimes that means that it has nothing to do with me. You know, sometimes, sometimes we need to know when to lead and when to follow. And, and both are important. And when you figure that out, I think that that's when you become the leader that you're meant to be. That is actually really nice advice to uh, be mindful of uh, spaces, definitely. Um, it seems that you really just keep continuing to grow and develop as a leader as you go on and the events that you take on. Yeah, well, I always got to flex that muscle, you know, and, uh, <laughs> definitely. and there's always work to be done. And uh, it's just really, I'm an activist to my core. That's who I am. And as long as I'm living, as long as I have a breath and I've got legs to walk on or, you know, a voice to speak with, I will raise it for other people, you know, wherever I can and do whatever I can. I really feel that's what I've been put on this earth to do. And, uh, and in that way, I get so much out of it as well, especially working with um, women and survivors of sexual abuse and LBGTQ2 plus youth, um, you know, for me, um, giving back means that, you know, a part of my heart is healing as well, you know, from the hurts of the past. And uh, it's been a bumpy road for me as well with coming to terms with sexuality because of my religious upbringing. And also I went to see a conversion therapist and, you know, there was a suicide attempt there in my teenage years because of the, the conversion therapy and, and, you know, so again for me like it's it's really about you know coming to terms with a number of different things but when i jumping back to to the superhero idea it's like you know when we're born we're we're 
we're really conditioned to believe that, you know, religion can save us or love can save us, you know, or, and I think that these things help us sometimes to get through whatever it is we're going through. But really the only thing, the only thing that can save us, the only person is really the one in the mirror, you know? And when I realized that I had the own agency, my own agency, when I could to, do for myself, what I really looked out, you know, I didn't, I didn't need to look out anymore. I knew I could give myself everything that I needed. You know, the possibilities are endless then. Really is. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I just keep doing what I do based on that. That's, uh, that's definitely really nice. Um, how you realize that like only you are the person that can get you out of tough spots that you're in sometimes. Um, because definitely that takes so much strength to do. Um, and with even more things trying to hold you back as well. Um, definitely commend you for being able to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I want, I want kids, kids to, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I just want kids out there to know that they don't have to be a statistic, you know? And, uh, and I think to myself, you know, if I didn't get to the hospital on time, I wouldn't have been here today, you know? And I think, wow. And so for me, I just want kids out there to know who are struggling that there's a way out and you'll get there, you know, and you're not alone. And so that's, that's why I do the work I do. No, I definitely, uh, I definitely understand that. That's very nice to always uh, reiterate the fact that um, there's always someone there for you, um, even if it feels like sometimes they're not. Yeah. Um, you've definitely been giving us really good advice this whole time. Um, thank you for that. <laughs> it really is a pleasure to chat, you know. Um, what's the best advice that you've actually ever been given then? You know, um, it's, uh, it was from, uh, a priest, actually a very good friend of mine. And, uh, there's a chapter about him in my book actually called the good priest. And, um, anyway, uh, I, I was in hospital re recovering from my suicide attempt in high school. And I wrote him about my sexuality, coming to terms with my, my sexuality at that point after the conversion therapy didn't work and he wrote me back and, and on the letter it was a beautiful letter that he wrote me and on the letter he a one line in the letter um was don't ever let your fear paralyze you and it has moved me ever since it has probably been the single most defining line one of them in my life and i never looked back and i was never afraid and I just kept on going. And that is the truth. And, uh, you know, he's shocked to hear that that line had so, that that line resonated so much with me, but um, it really, really did. And it was at a time when I was very vulnerable. I was in the psychiatric ward of health sciences, you know, teenager with all these adults and, and just coming out of a, a, an attempt to end my life and uh, recovering from that. I had physically recovered. And then now I was in this, on the psychiatric ward and, and, uh, that line really, it moved me in every way. And here I am. So um, don't let fear paralyze you. You know, uh, use it as a motivator because, uh, you know, it's, and I, I think, you know, when I was walking on the highway and I had to spend all, the t all that time alone, I think, you know, realize, I realized that my biggest fear was, was myself, you know, and, and my biggest obstacle has always been myself. I had to get out of my own way and realize that there was nothing that I could, couldn't do, you know? And, and, uh, and that meant at the time when I ended the walk, you know, exploring, um, this transition. It's, um, it's kind of amazing how sometimes such a small moment to someone such as literally writing a line on a letter has such a big impact yeah. on someone. Um, because sometimes it's just very hard to, imagine i guess what space that other person is in a lot yeah well totally i mean i think a lot of the things i say to other people as well is it you know are things that i've said to myself or you know i like to remind myself of you know and and uh i think i'm certain I'm, I'm certain that you know when people write these types of things to me that they're you know they're saying it to themselves as well or that they they too have been there in those places, you know, sometimes. And, and uh, you know, and I'm not saying that everyone has to do this all the time or everyone has to go out and change laws or speak out or do it. You know, sometimes uh, getting up out of bed 
is is you know you should congratulate yourself over that because that's hurt going out into the world and, and facing things that are out there the uncertainty that is this pandemic you know i mean really just being kind to one another is 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 key and that can change someone's life too you don't even know you know so uh i think that that's something that we all need to be aware of uh even if i'm having a bad day or something i try not to be uh, grumpy when i go out you know because you Definitely. never know you know so no 100 percent um 100% couldn't agree with you more on that one. Um, I don't even know what more I could say about that. Um, literally, hammer right to the nail. Um, it's definitely super important. Um, I guess stepping back to what you said about being genuine and how you said that these people writing you probably um, said this to themselves like every day. Um, so it's, it's definitely important to always speak what you believe as well. Um, and it's very nice to see you doing that. Thank you. I could we like hang out because you're so complimentary that like I think you're just really I just really am digging your energy right now and, and uh that's you know that's all right. Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm so flattered. Um I definitely understand what like what you mean by saying um you just go out there and try to be the best person that you can be to other people because you never know what's going on. Um I mean like I have no idea how you're doing in life right now. Um I haven't spoken to you in about 2 years. Um and even then it was only brief. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Um I mean personally I'm terrified all the time. I don't have an immune system. So like when someone's like super nice to me and like respectful like it's just makes my day. Yeah. Well good. That's good, you know. It's important. <laughs> really important. I love doing these like spontaneous things for people. Like I I show up sometimes to people's doorstep and just drop off flowers or you know f fruit or or like for me that that that's like a, a joyous act of like spontaneous rebellion you know that uh spontaneous no matter rebellion. What, yeah no matter what kind of trauma i've been through in my life that that's not gonna that's not gonna define me you know that this is my way of saying universe i got this you know and i'm gonna give it back to someone else you know and and uh and that's what keeps me going too in a way you know, and, and it's really, uh, it's really just nice to, to, to give without any expectation, you know? Definitely. No, um, you definitely must like face a lot of conflict, um, like internal, external, um, how, um, how do you deal with um, all this conflict in your position? I guess, besides, um, trying to, um, do the most that you can for others as well. Well, I'm a trained mediator. I've done some mediation training. Yeah, that's helped. That's that's certainly helped. Um, you know, and in terms of conflict at any point, I always think about, you know, I try to remember to take a breath and, and I think about in this scenario, like, what can I own? Is there something that I can own here that will make the situation easier? You know, um, what's interesting is, you know, transitioning and taking up male space now and having to think about how I'm communicating with women, you know, my shoulders are broader, my voice is deeper, um, you know, so I'm not as aware of my tone, you know, or how to gauge myself in that way. So there's been a kind of like a relearning, I suppose, of, uh, of you know, the type of space that I take up now and having to rethink things. But because I've had lived experience as a woman, it makes it um, a little bit more easier for me because I'm able to to kind of uh, think of it from different perspectives, you know? So that helps with conflict as well. Um, yeah. No, definitely nice to be um, intersectional and mindful of those things. Um, you mentioned how the intersectional view of it um, makes it very easy. Um, first of all, I love that you do look at it from an intersectional approach and that you do be mindful of like the space that you take up in places now. Um, with this knowledge and like the parents and such like that. Um, definitely really good characteristics of a leader, um, first of all. Um, what do you um, think is the most difficult part about being a leader though? It's lonely sometimes. It really is. Definitely. Uh, you know, I'm having lived experience as a woman and, and uh, you know, being a survivor of sexual abuse and being someone who is queer, you know, I mean, I've, I've been marginalized already. 
but when you live a public life, you put yourself out there constantly. Um, you know, you you have to be mindful of that, and um, you know, it's like I said when I when I applied for a non-binary birth certificate, and I I got it. I was the first one in the entire country, and in, in other parts of the world too. I mean, it's very new. And, Literally made uh, headlines. <laughs> and it was just really, you know, it, so it, it was something that I just felt I had to do. But then when it was done, it was like, whoa, you know, so, you know, sometimes when you make decisions and you take those risks, um, you can be prepared to think about everything, you know, the bigger picture and what that means for you, what that means for the people around you in your life. And also if you're going to get any blowback and you need to be very solid in yourself. Um, before you go out on that kind of a limb and, and uh, certainly lonely sometimes, but it's a sacrifice that I'm always willing to make. Oh, that was so nice. Um, definitely. I guess you had to really consider um, a lot of what being in the spotlight would do for you and your family um, and who you chose to like bring into that and along the journey. Um, yeah, they're used to it now. <laughs> they got, they adjusted. <laughs> And they're they're very over me. They're like, yeah, it's uh, it's hilarious actually. But uh, no, they, it, I mean, they live with it too, and and they're my biggest uh, defenders, and uh, especially my mother. Nobody will mess with Linda, you know. She's a, a force for sure, and uh, you know, it's it's uh, just who I am, and people accept that. Definitely, definitely. Um... I guess uh, backtracking even more um, right at the beginning. So in addition to all of this and everything you have done, you also became an author last year, um, as was mentioned before, um, talking about your book. Um, did you want us to tell us a little bit about Almost Feral? Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, I'm sure my publisher would be happy. Uh, no, I, uh, I mean, I, I had the book written in my head as I was walking, and uh, the walk is the narrative framework for the book, it's a memoir, but as I'm walking uh, the endless clicks along the highway, I'm thinking back to past experiences, mostly from childhood, that have framed my uh, parts of my identity. And so I revisit them as I'm walking to kind of push through the physical pain that I'm experiencing. And um, so I literally say I walk from one side of the island to the other side of myself, because by the time I finish the walk, I've decided to transition. And um, I wanted to play with the, the, the narrative a bit. So I didn't want it to be like a day-by-day -day breakdown of a walk. I wanted it to be different. I wanted to really be creative in how I, I wrote the memoir. So I broke it up. It, you know, it, 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 go, it transitions like me it, as, you know, it's a movement. So the, the book symbolizes that movement. So there's a few days on the highway and then it goes back to my past. And it goes back to, my, to a few days on the highway and then back to the past. So back and forth, symbolizing that movement, symbolizing that transition, um, and uh, you know, taking everyone with me on the journey. There's more than one journey, the one that I'm on, and the one that I've been on all my life since I was born. So it's doing really well. I'm, I'm you know, I, I just got published in Japan, and won a few awards, like I'm, I'm thrilled. Uh, I'm donating half the proceeds, half my royalties uh, this year to the Pathways Foundation. Uh, oh, wow. So, uh, and that's the organization I founded for survivors of religious institutional abuse, for those who don't know. And, um, and I'm just so thrilled that the book is doing so well because, um, you know, it really elevates the causes that I, I represent. And um, I'm just so glad people are enjoying it, you know, and, and I don't hold anything back there. So, um, yeah. No, I think um, when you are a leader, um, the most important thing is to be transparent. Um, I definitely think as a leader, it's super important to be relatable so that, um, well, I mean, you said your role models are like your mother and your grandmother. Um, and I mean, definitely people see you as theirs um, on your journey. So it's definitely super important that like, you're so transparent to be relatable that it just kind of helps people move along as well as you did. Well, that's um, one thing, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, oh, no, I was just gonna say like literally like moving forward on a road but also like through your life trying to um figure out what turns next yeah i think we all are really and you know that's one thing about my book it's that it's not a book about a person who's transgender 
you know um it's about all these identities that intersect that lead us on the path to where we are going and who we are today you know as we continue on in this road of life I mean to be figurative and uh you know we're all human we all feel love the same we all feel pain the same we all have anger we all have these emotions and get carried away on this tide of emotions sometimes and we're human we need to look at each other from a human level you know not from all of these binary lenses that we seem to trap each other in because we're more than those things that's what my next book will be about living within this binary that i'm experiencing well, now of, of you know not being one or the other and what i'm seeing there you know from all different kinds of sides uh i think that would be very nice um i'm sure it's not an easy thing for people to go to um i wouldn't know of course but i can only imagine um it would be a very confusing time um as you said before um like trying to figure out who you were then like maybe like I don't fit at one end of the scale or the other. Um, who am I? Yeah. Well, I spent all this time, you know, trying to fit in and be normal. And now I'm like, well, who wants to do that? I don't ever want to fit in and I don't ever want to be normal because I'm not. I'm like, and I, I really feel like this is where it's at, you know? And so, uh, like I said to anyone out there who wants to listen, it's really, you know who we are. And, uh, you don't have to have anything else to tell you how to be really you can just be yourself and and that's that's the main journey i think that we're all on that's the main road that we have to travel on and that we're all on and 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 uh and that's what makes us similar in many ways this is why i literally had so much difficulty trying to write a brief introduction for you because I'm like, how do i encompass all of this into a few lines i'm like i don't want to just settle on listing out some things that you did over the years um because there's so much um and there's so much to you as a person um <laughs> you didn't make it easy <laughs> well story of my life really oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, totally fair totally fair um i guess um along the journey um you mentioned i guess many bumps in the road um of how to get to where you were today, um, some difficult decisions had to be made. Mm -hmm. um, how do you make those? I go with my gut, go with my heart, and the rest falls into place. And if it doesn't, that's okay too. Because really I've learned just as much from my mistakes as I have from other experiences. I don't have any regrets because all of the things I've been through have led me to where I am. And really at this point in my life, I can look in the mirror and say that I love the person that I am. And not just because I look this way. It has, it has more to do with the inside than anything. It's internalization. Yeah. Definitely. No, that's, um, that's really nice. Um, that was beautiful. <laughs> um, so sorry, I'm so full of compliments today. Um, yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> Um, I've definitely loved hearing about your journey. I love hearing about anyone's journey, how they've decided to just break of what, like break out of what they told that they were supposed to be, um, to truly be who they want to be. Um, um, so this series is called the Launch Force Series. Um, and being a MUN alumni, you obviously know the, the motto, um, Launch Force Into the Deep. Um, how can your story inspire others to launch forth on their own leadership journey? That's like a big question. Um, I don't know. I hope that, you know, people can hear what I have to say and, and relate to different struggles within their own lives. Um, you know, again, I think, people's individual journey is, is just that. And, um, I'm not here trying to tell people how to be or what to do, but, you know, I think that we have within ourselves the ability to transcend any limits, even the ones that we self-impose, you know, and that choice is up to us. And I think that we get presented with different opportunities um, in our lives that are difficult and 
we're given an option to how we're going to handle that. And sometimes we pass it, sometimes we fail. But I think outlook is everything. And um, I'm a hopeful romantic. I'm, a, I'm a, an optimist. I, um, I fall in love with life over and over again, despite how many times I've, I've had heartbreaks, you know. Uh, there's always uh, creativity and imagination to pull us through and, and beautiful things out there to inspire us. And, and so hold on to that and hold on to yourselves. You know, I mean, really to, to, to take a leadership role, you, you do have to be solid in, in yourself and, and it takes a while to get there, but you know, go with your gut, go with your heart. I will tell you this. I've never told anyone this before. This would be between you and me, Allison. Um, <laughs> When I was a I kid, never... <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to uh, I I love classical music and I I, um, I you know was trained in flute guitar and, and piano. I never stuck with it, oh. but I loved. I always wanted to be a conductor, and so I'd listen to classical music and I'd always conduct. Pretend I was a conductor of an orchestra, and and uh, I also grew up with a lot of architects in my life. My mother worked with architects, and so I always wanted to be an architect or a conductor. You know, I'm not, I'm neither of those things, but, um, I do think that leadership is like that. You know, it is almost like conducting people into this kind of, this beautiful choir, this beautiful orchestra, you know, to, to kind of get our hearts in tune and, and, and kind of sing the same song in, in some way and set a course, you know, and, and, uh, and as for building, you know, I don't really build buildings, but I like to build people and communities. And so, uh, so even if you're a kid and you, you know, you want to be something, you look back at your life and you think, oh, I'm not there yet. I'm not where I wanted to be or I'm not who I wanted to be or whatever. There's lots of time and you're doing it probably in different ways, in ways that you don't even realize, you know? Definitely, definitely. Um, I'd come see your orchestra. <laughs> um, we actually do have a question from someone in the chat. Okay. Um, they wanted to know what accomplishment you're most proud of. <laughs> That's easy. Um, you know, lots of awards and, and, and certificates and, and all those things. But honestly, um, every single day I go into a supermarket or a store or whatever, someone comes up to me and, and uh, hugs me. Well, not so much now because we're in a pandemic. So I'm, I'm, I'm missing those hugs, really. I'm a big hugger. Um, but they say, you know, you're... I'm a sexual abuse survivor. I was abused by a priest or I was abused by a nun or I was abused by a Christian brother or a teacher or a coach or, you know, whatever, or I'm struggling with, with, with depression or anxiety or, you know, or thank you. My son, you know, is, is gay or whatever. I get a hug and a thank you. And, and, uh, you know, I can't put that on my wall and frame it, but that to me feels like even just from one person, it feels like that's the biggest accomplishment. That's really all I can truly hope for. And that is, truth from the bottom of my heart i uh i feel more alive when 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 i get a hug from someone and they tell me something like that i feel um very successful and very accomplished definitely i know that's so nice to hear um i guess just going even to the grocery store much impacted you've never even met <laughs> oh, i mean i don't i really go to the grocery store and i don't come out until like two three hours later really uh <laughs> because I end up talking with everyone, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'm truly lucky in so many ways that so many people have opened their hearts to me and, uh, yeah. And that's, that's um, really, really wow. Well. And speaking of which, um, congratulations on celebrating your wedding anniversary recently as well. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Lots of, uh, lots of, uh, celebrations and, uh, and, uh, things to, to be blessed about, you know, be lucky. No, definitely. It's uh, it's definitely really nice. Um, just you exert like so much happiness. Um, this big pathway to life. Um, I guess it's always nice for a lot of people to see such happiness come out of it, um, even if it didn't start out nice. Well, you know, I make myself happy first, and that's the bottom line, because I've got everything that I need in me to do that. And I wake up every day and I think, am I going to be happy today? It's up to me. It's not up to anyone around me. And then once you make that decision with yourself, you choose yourself, then whatever anybody else is doing around you, that doesn't matter as much. you know. And so that's where my happiness comes from, truly.
definitely. Um, we have another question as well. Um, so when you make a movie about your life, who would you like to play you? Oh, oh God, that's such a, <laughs> such a, a big question. Uh, I really thought about it. I don't know. I mean, when I think about uh, movies, my favorite movie is The Sound of Music. And so I love Julie Andrews, so, but I don't think Julie Andrews would actually be able to play me at this point. Uh, but I've, I've tried to be her in, in many times for spinning around my living room. But uh, maybe you're, I don't even know if you know that movie because I'm kind of old now. Um, that's okay. Don't say I, that. I watch it. You're going to feel. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. That's, uh, yeah. I don't know. That's a weird question for me, anyway, to think about that. I have no idea who'd play me in, in, uh, in a movie. Um, well, yeah. if you ever decide to make a movie about your life, um, that's definitely number one question to ask yourself. I think so, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't want to make a movie about myself, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, in terms, I mean, the documentary was done by someone else, but, uh, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know. I'm balding now, so maybe Bruce Willis? I'm not sure. Um, oh. Or someone younger. I don't know. <laughs> who's, who's, uh, who's cool out there now? Oh, I don't know. I, I watch documentaries. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, like Brad Pitt? No, I'm better looking than him. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I, I'm certainly not at a loss for words very often, but whoever uh, put that question in there has uh, stumped me. Well, congratulations to whoever asked that uh, that question. <laughs> um, Julia says you could play yourself again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my that's God, always an there. option. Hey. You did it once. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's true. I did do it once, and that was weird too. It was actually yeah, but I don't know. I'm gonna think about that one more. Um, yeah. Uh, to the person that did ask the question about the movie about Gemma's life, um, if you haven't seen it, um, you should definitely go watch Just Be Gemma. Um, it's actually amazing. Um. I highly recommend it. Yeah, it's on the CBC Gem series, so you can Google Just Be Gemma or, you know, if you don't have anything to do um, someday or whatever, but it's on the CBC documentary uh, webpage. There you go. <laughs> um, it's 3.55. This is supposed to end at uh, 4 o'clock. Um, I guess maybe a last question. Um, Things are very confusing right now. Obviously, a lot of services were shut down to like so many people. Um, people are very confused about where they're going in life, um, what their next step is, whether they're like starting university or I mean, if they're like me, I was supposed to be leaving the semester. I'm staying another year now because I can't get a job. Um, <laughs> what is some advice that you have for these people um, from a leadership perspective? What can they do to keep themselves involved? Use the time to regroup. Honestly, I, uh, I mean, nothing has really changed for me uh, in my life because um, I'm executive director of this organization called Art Force, which is a charity for at-risk youth. So, and Pathways is for survivors of clergy abuse. So, really, I still I come into my office every day um, because the organizations are essential, you know. Um, but you know, things have slowed down a little bit in terms of how I've been able to go, I don't have to go to as many meetings. I have meetings on Zoom, but I'm able to do that on the spot. So I've been using the time to regroup, to get back into nature. I'm swimming all the time, I'm boxing, I'm hiking. I'm just focused on being physical um, and uh, you know, just regrouping. And I think that that's important for us to do. If anything, we can use this time to, to reflect and uh, Think about how better to take care of ourselves because that's really the important thing too. If you want to be a leader, you know you really have to focus on self care. And um, you know sometimes I talk to a therapist if I want to, if I need to. Sometimes I go to the doctor if I need to. I don't put anything off, you know. And uh, you got to take care of yourself in every way. So I've been using that to really uh, to really look at how I can change my life and uh, better for the better and take care better care of myself so that when I have to take on these big things that I'm, uh, I'm equipped for it. Definitely. I think that's definitely um, a hard thing to do sometimes when you know you have so much to do to just, um, for like the large, just focus on like the one. <laughs> totally. Um, well, 
just wanted to thank you again so much for uh, joining us today. I know you thanked us for inviting you and such, but I mean, without you, it wouldn't happen. Um, oh, you're so sweet. Uh, yeah. And I uh, wanted to thank everyone who came to watch. Um, and I guess if you're watching this in the future recording, um, thank you so much for taking the time to watch it. <laughs> yes, thank you to everyone. And uh, I didn't even know, I couldn't even really see. What's, I was, I'm so focused on you, Allison. I didn't realize I could see people there at the bottom. And then there's, oh, there's Haley, and then there's Julia, and then there's other people there that I don't know. Hello, people I don't know. Um, but thank you, everyone, for uh, participating. And uh, it's really been a pleasure. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, both Gemma and Allison. It was a great conversation to listen to. And uh, we heard some fantastic advice from you, Gemma. So thank you. We really appreciate you taking the time today. To speak with us. Thank you. Really, it was my pleasure. Honored. All right. Fantastic. Cheers. Awesome. We'll have a great day, everyone. You too. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye. Enjoy the weather. <laughs>